policy and rights entrepreneur and editor of NS legislation. Uh, he will talk to us about the NS market in the EU and in Greece, status and prospects. If you have a floor, Mr. Stephanie, we would like to thank you for your presentation and for your willingness to participate in our conference. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there are certainly more ladies here than gentlemen. This is good for us gentlemen. Um, thank you for attending this special convention and of course uh, congratulations to you, the organizing committee and Elsa in general. Um, when I was a student of law school here in Thessaloniki at Stockholm University, it was 25 years ago exactly that I was entering the school. Um, I would feel very lucky to be able to attend such a convention that will eventually and hopefully open your eyes in a more specific sector of the uh, legal uh, uh, of the legal of your legal studies. Um, I'm happy also to see Mr. Thodos Managos here, the professor, a distinct professor of energy law. Uh, and let me start in order to avoid uh, creating a lot of time and consuming a lot of your time. The title, The Rest Market in EU and Greece. So let me firstly tell you that I will focus mainly on Greece, not in order to avoid the EU dimension of the rest prospects, but because Greece obviously is a member of the EU, I would call it a member with distinct uh, capabilities but also uh, problems. Uh, hindrances in the energy market. So it will provide me the opportunity to describe a little bit the prospects within the EU, but by focusing mainly on Greece. Can you please change the, the first slide? So just to start, here you can see the, uh, the development of the renewable energy sources over time in Greece, the installed capacity, just to have a, a clear vision of what we're talking about. You will see that here, when I was also writing um, parts of the energy legislation, of renewable legislation in 2005 and 2006, uh, we, we were in a very uh, small capacity level. We have managed, of course, to grow. Uh, this growth has not come, um, you know, easily or without any problems. We have had our problems and we still have our problems. Uh, but there has been an evolution following the EU trends uh, the, the most problematic years, I would call them, was when the crisis started and through 2010, 2014, because especially in the field of the PVs, we had a big problem with uh, overcapacity being installed in short period of time and also with the prices set, the fit-in tariffs set at that particular period, uh, problems that we had to uh, tackle later on with a new deal that was uh, introduced in 2014. Can we please move on? Um, this is the installed capacity per year, just again to show that there is the, the evolution, how this trend moved forward. You can see uh, the, the, the years where the PVs provided for huge expansion. Uh, I would say that the wind energy had always been following a more logical pathway, a more reasonable pathway, because of course uh, the scale there is much bigger, as you can understand. Uh, please, can we move on? This is, as I was talking to you about the wind power, you can see here the installed megawatt per, uh, per wind energy producer. This is for you just to have a clear picture of how this is being implemented in Greece. We have some big houses, I would call them some big companies that, of course, maintain the big level uh, of uh, uh, wind um, uh, utilization. But also check here the others, which shows that we have a small level of maturity permitting small players to enter the market. I will come to this a little bit later, later when I will focus on later slides, on following slides. Why I show you this? The evolution is a key part in what we are discussing. I mean, uh, energy and how you utilize, how you use it, is partly, uh, due to, is partly uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of what the technology allows you to do. So you can see here the minimum, the maximum, and the weighted average. The weighted average is the dots of the rotor diameter per year. 
you can see how this has been evolving through the years, allowing for bigger capacity per space. Please. So, here we come to the good ones. This is the renewables development in EU over time. The big thing here is, of course, and it's visible, uh, you can see it clearly with a blue line, this is the wind. You can see that it maintained a very smooth upward curve. And the important thing is that whereas wind and solar, here the green one, the, the, the light green one, have been following this trend, check this. The nuclear has been showing a stability but also decreasing a little bit, but mainly coal, the black one, and the fuel oil have been declining at the same period. This is, of course, the trend within the EU totally, and the, I would say globally, apart from certain markets such as India and China, which have their distinct characteristics. Uh, I think it's a, yeah. Here we have the renewable share in final electricity consumed and final energy consumed. And you can see here that today we move, it's around 24, 24 point something, uh, the, uh, the share in final electricity consumption, uh, whereas the projection for 2030, according to the National Energy and Climate Plan of the Ministry, is the 56% mark. This is, of course, a very good uh, sign, which shows the goals that have been set, but we will check later on why it is not enough if we see it through the, glass, through the glasses of what follows 2030 and how we are being prepared for the period after 2030. Uh, please. So, here we have the required investments for the period 2020-2030. That means how much money we will have to uh, put in the energy, the renewable energy markets, uh, projects, sorry, in order to reach these goals that you looked in the previous slide. You will see here that the renewable energy source for electricity generation that will be installed, hopefully, it's 8.5 billion euros. This is the estimated money that will be needed. Whereas the electrical system, which is, of course, very necessary because you cannot have this if you don't have this optimization, is estimated at 5.5 billion. This is the same with the distribution grids, very necessary. Uh, but let me also show you this one, which is extremely important, the energy efficiency. This is, when we're talking about the renewable energy source, this is only one side of the coin. There is also the other side of the coin. You cannot preserve the environment and follow good environmental policies unless you have a clear pathway of what you want to do with the energy, of how you use energy, how you consume energy in all the uh, sectors of the economic life, but also um, our everyday life. So the general total is a uh, standard in 32.7 for Greece. Again, I tell you, this is not a European level. Uh, can we please move on? This is the same slide. It is highlighted, it is highlighting, sorry, the things that I mentioned before, uh, this is something that uh, needs to be put into perspective. Of course, let me, this is a great opportunity for me to tell something that is a, um, a huge problem when you uh, make uh, investments in Greece, general investments, but uh, more importantly, energy, renewable energy sources investments. This is what we project. But uh, the truth is that when you try uh, to make uh, energy projects in Greece, you have a big monster, the bureaucracy. So that means that all of this always has a question mark. Will the people and the companies involved be able to conclude all the necessary bureaucratic procedures in order to be able to put the money into, the, uh, re into real projects? This is a question mark. And of course, all of this trend, uh, you know, needs to be seen within this framework, within this setting of how we diminish, how we uh, in decrease, sorry, the bureaucracy that holds back, especially the renewable energy sources projects. Can we please move on? <coughs> so this is uh, what I referred 
two was part of the challenges and requirements of the National Energy and Climate Plan. Uh, mainly, this is what we need in order to make sure that we reach the 56% uh, goal. So we need adequate measures and actions, especially for the period after 2030. You see, if someone sees what are the projections after 2030, uh, you will understand there that we're talking about 60%. So that means that the whole plan lacks the necessary vision for the period after 2013. It also lacks the monitoring procedures, the description of the monitoring techniques for the period until 2030 in order to be able that to be able to safeguard the goals set uh, are, are being uh, thoroughly followed and will be succeeded. The action plan also should include a roadmap for large renewable energy sources projects, large onshore wind farms, wind offshore with special focus to floating wind offshore, storage systems, etc. There is also need for a complete plan for the auctions of new capacities with more specific volumes and timing. What we have at the moment is we have a general, a generic description of how these uh, tender procedures will run through the year, but we don't have certain dates, we don't have certain capacities. So that means that potential investors are not in a position to go to the banker or to sit down uh, together with their people, their technicians and their uh, financial CFOs and discuss of how their projected uh, vision, their project, will be able to run and with what feeding, sliding uh, tariff that they will need to beat in the tender procedure. So there is, a, you know, a, a vague uh, scenery for all the people that want to invest in this market at the moment due to the lack of this particular plan for the auctions. More ambitious plan for the interconnections of the islands. This is of huge importance because you see, Greece has maintains one of the best uh, potentials of, of of wind energy in the European Union. Specifically, the Aegean area is provides huge uh, wind potential. So that means that if we are uh, to uh, utilize this potential and generate the energy that it can provide us, we need definitely interconnections with the islands. There have been some, uh, but certainly we need more. Uh, the vision of the Greek policymakers should be, and the EU policymakers should be, to reach to a point, reach to a level where the Greek Aegean mainly islands would be interconnected with the main uh, system, electricity system of Greece. Because this area also holds a geostrategic importance for Greece. It is not only its energy importance, it is the geostrategic importance for Greece, but also for the EU. This is an outer border of the European Union. I don't need to mention the existence of Turkey uh, eastwards. So if the Greek policymakers understand uh, the potential of this area, we need to persuade our EU partners that we should make this area a EU active uh, electricity generation area, but also electricity storage area. So this will provide this Aegean area, the Greek Aegean area, with the importance for the EU. And therefore, it will increase its geostrategic importance for our EU partners. More safety, more international understanding of what we have in the Aegean with our neighbors. So this is the last one, is that uh, exactly this uh, plan that the Ministry has set lacks the vision for international interconnections targeted to make Greece an exporter of green energy. This comes without my previous reference, because even if you generate a lot of electricity from the Aegean or from your main system, from your mainland or from uh, whatever source, you certainly need to be able to export it. So therefore you will need grids, you will need the system, the electricity system to be able to take this energy and bring it to the countries that need it most, which is the Central and North European countries. So therefore we need to have within the plan a clear vision of what we want to increase in export in grid capacity in order to be able to export. And you know, the EU provides uh, through the Council of Energy Ministers, the, the EU Commission, sorry, provides the necessary economic tools for countries 
to, uh, uh, to, to search. So that means that Greece has the potential, by opening such a discussion with its EU partners, to put the interconnections that I'm talking about in a priority funding position within the European Commission. This is what we have done in 2005 with the east part of TAP, of the modern TAP. Then it was ITGI, it was the Italy, Turkey, Greece interconnector. It was in June 2005 that this particular project, and of course we have here the uh, distinct Mr. Panagos who, who will be talking to you about the gas, but I'm referring to this mainly to show you that the funding tools exist within the European Union, within the European Commission, and we need to focus on them in order to make the necessary uh, interconnections that will make us, hopefully, exporters within the next 10, 15 years. So, these are the characteristics of what the renewable energy sources market of tomorrow, of present and mainly tomorrow, will look like. And the characteristics are that, are that we will be able to sell electricity directly in the market, the, the renewable energy producers, that is. Uh, that the uh, uh, RES investments are subject to balancing responsibilities. Right now, we don't have these uh, responsibilities, but bigger projects will have these balancing responsibilities unless no liquid intraday market exists. The operating gate is granted as a premium. That means that we don't have the feed-in tariff scheme that we used to have up until now. It only remains as a, a partial um, uh, ability for small projects like until 500 kilowatts of PVs or uh, 3 megawatts of PV, oh sorry, of wind uh, farms. And uh, above these levels, there will be a feeding premium, a sliding feeding premium scheme that will be paying the renewable energy projects. Smaller projects are not balancing responsible. This is, uh, these are the main characteristics of the new scheme. Greece has designed a sliding, as I told you, FIP, the uh, feeding premium uh, support mechanism. This follows the trend of the European Union, of course. We're not alone in this. We follow the trend that needs to bring the renewables within a market regime, whereas up until now, it is out of the market. The, the, the price was set only uh, institutionally, and the people were being paid according to their set feeding tariff. Right now, renewables are entering the market. You can see where you can find the details about the scheme, and it also needs to be said that for the first time we have uh, a, a totally approved uh, support mechanism by the European Commission. Please. Uh, the participation in the market means more opportunities, as always, but also means more risks, more uh, fears for people uh, involved for the first time, big investors that may be entering the market for the first time, but also creates a lot of costs because you have parallel things that have to be paying for balancing. Uh, you have a lot of markets being opening, the intraday, the forward market, the day ahead market. So that means that you need a lot of people having the uh, know-how in order to operate smoothly within this set of markets that is being created. Uh, it is, of course, important to know that the producers of electricity through RES uh, through RES, uh, can outsource the new obligations to aggregators. And there is significant uncertainty on the timing for the proper competition of the above design, both at the legislative, institutional level, and technical IT level. This is where cost also being created, more cost for the uh, enterprises being involved. Can we please move on? So this is just a short description of what is uh, the feeding uh, sliding, the feeding premium, uh, the sliding feeding premium scheme that we have uh, set here in Greece. So the remuneration of the energy generated by such a plant will be based on a reference value, which shortly is the reference market price plus a premium. Whereas up until now, I repeat, it was only a firmly set feed-in tariff. So what is the reference market? The reference market price is calculated as the hourly system marginal price, the day ahead price. And the premium is calculated on a monthly base. So that means that this passes through a clearance procedure. 
taking into account the electricity produced by, by all wind farms, when we're talking about wind farms, or by big PVs, in a way incentivizing, it provides the incentive to those producing more valuable electricity at house with higher demand, higher market prices. So this plus this will be creating the reference value. Uh, as I told you before, for smaller projects, uh, the RV is stable. So this actually takes us back to the system that we have had until now, the feed-in tariff system. After 2017, uh, the reference value is determined by auctions, as I told you again before, uh, with the problems that these initial auctions always present, due to immaturity mainly. The auction system has been approved, this is also to be mentioned, we have an approved system by the European Commission, so that means that it, 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 is not, it will not be hindered later on by actions of the European Commission, we have the clearance from them. The auctions are electronic, are online, and let me tell you that uh, this area we're standing here today is the stock market of Thessaloniki. Part of what we were discussing, we will, it will be cleared by the stock exchange market of the energy stock market, okay? So possibly this uh, building will also be providing such services later on. Uh, mainly there will be auctions for photovoltaics up to 20 megawatts, that is up to 20 megawatts per, per each uh, project that will be entering the auction. For wind onshore, uh, between 3 to 50 megawatts, and common auctions for PVs and wind on, onshore with larger capacity. So, online scheduled auctions in Greece. The first auction was on July 2, 2018. I will show you the results which show the pattern and the trend that will be evolving within the next couple of years. And the second auction was on December 10, 2018. Let's, let's have a clear look, a small look, sorry, uh, on what happened in the first auction. So you see, for example, per category, that this is the small PV category, this is the uh, medium PV category, and there is the B, how, how we call it, of the medium wind category. You can see the maximum auction capacity that was of, on offer on that day, uh, the final auction capacity that actually has been accepted by the system uh, to enter, the starting bid, look at it, and the minimum level of competition. Now, we go to the awarded capacity, which is the most important. The awarded capacity, uh, sorry, the, the prices. Uh, the lowest and highest selected bid, you can see the lowest and highest selected bid of the projects that have been accepted, that have been awarded uh, capacity, and the weighted average of bids. Look at these averages and look at the starting bids. You can see there that there has been a good maturity uh, of technology but also of market experience by the, 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 the people and the enterprises entering uh, the first auction to support lower prices, lower bids. Let's move on to the second auction. See, here you will see also that the final output of the procedure provided for similar prices, whereas in the big or medium wind section, we have a 58.58 um, uh, price, uh, euros per megawatt hour, which is important for the next one. Look at this. Here we have a comparison between Greece and Germany. Why I put Germany? Because Germany has, or let's, let's call it correctly, Greece has actually copied the German system 100%. So that means that you can see here the megawatts awarded within the four auctions that took place in Germany in 2018. And here you can see the results of the two auctions at the same period in Greece. You will see, first of all, this is not important. What is important is the final, of course, prices. You can see the prices here, but let's focus on that one because it's similar to the Greek price. You can see that there is a maturity in Germany that allows for smaller bids, but also there is bigger scale of projects that allows for this kind of bids and this kind of set prices. But it is phenomenal that we have managed to have this kind of bids uh, in the Greek system because we lack the necessary maturity and let's say we, we lack the necessary scale to have similar 
characteristics. But, however, competition has allowed for these similar characteristics, which, of course, is good for all the consumers. Let's move on to the, to the next one. This is the price that I showed you, that, that I showed you uh, just before, the final, the bold prices in Germany and in Greece, have to be looked in context with this, because this is the uh, day ahead price. This is the marginal price of the system uh, per, uh, per month here, the average, okay? So, in 2018, here is where the auction took place. Look where the marginal price was. It was about 73 uh, euros per megawatt hour. That means that the price that have been provided as bids in the two auctions in 2018 have been smaller than the then average price of the electrical system. That only tell us, tells us that the renewable energy sources were cheaper than the average price set on those dates. So that means there's no clear pathway just to show that the reality calls for more renewable energy sources projects. So that means that there is no longer any, uh, let's call it, uh, need to think that these are expensive or these will create bigger uh, costs for the consumer. No, we have passed this threshold. Uh, okay, um, this is just to show you that even the crisis has not diminished, has not uh, decreased the interest of investors uh, in this particular market. Because uh, it is true that the renewables have great upside, also in Greece, and of course within the European Union as a whole. The upside uh, is huge, the potential is huge, the profitability is good, so this is why, even within the years of the crisis, the uh, investment interest was high, and the actual investments being uh, conducted were big and successful. Okay, a lot of numbers, a lot of text. Let me show you two pictures just to, to break this, uh, the, the ice or the negativity from the numbers. These are two uh, big projects in Greece with characteristics that I wanted to show you. The first is where I can see and locate the future of wind energy utilization in Greece. That means in no one's land, in nowhere land, as I call it, that means on the rocks, not the touristic high value ones necessarily, but on the rocks of our Aegean beauty. This is where we can maintain high level of energy wind potential utilization. You can see here in Agios Georgios project, which is near Attica, to be honest, that means it's close to uh, Attica, to Athens, is 73.2 megawatts. The other are technical with the best of the machinery that has been installed. But you can select this and visualize how all that I mentioned before for the Aegean and the utilization of the wind potential there will be looking. And this is the Panahaiko project. This is uh, this has long been the biggest wind farm project in Greece up until recently uh, when I think three or four of them have surpassed it in the total output. But this was also a phenomenal project of each era. This is the mainland and this is the uh, non-mainland system. This is uh, our aquatic, let's say, electricity system. Let's move forward. So, the vision. I mentioned most of the things that uh, are mentioned here, I mentioned them before, but we, as I told before, we need to exploit our potential. We have huge potential. And this is a source. Of course, we will be looking and we need to be looking, even as policy makers, we need to be looking at creating the right um, uh, equilibrium of how we utilize and how we exploit energy of all sources. That means that Yes, we need to perform with higher speed all, the, all, all these that are necessary in order to have results uh, from uh, uh, potential fields of gas and, uh, and uh, oil uh, south of Crete or anywhere else. But we necessarily need to move even uh, speedier on exploiting our wind and PV and solar potential. The huge wind potential of the Aegean Sea, onshore and offshore, I underline this again. 
the development of a strong global supply chain, that means that we can have added value in our economy. And yes, the wind sector is provides more opportunities in this world than the solar, which has, has shown a, a bigger maturity and there is no need for that uh, onwards. Uh, the large international interconnections, no need to repeat this. The foreign and local investments, you see, let me, let me just mention something here. What our previous slides showed us is that it is good to uh, expand the investment uh, possibilities and capabilities to more players, smaller players, low-scale players. But if it is to achieve a level of small bids, good competition, and good cheap energy prices to final consumers, we certainly need scale from this point onwards. That means that we need big companies uh, to get into this party even more actively. We need companies that have access to funding, to low cost funding, because if I go to the banker, I will have an interest that will not allow me to be competitive in my bids in such auctions. So we need, generally, companies that can make projects of bigger scale. This is where uh, the momentum lies in the renewable energy sector market from here onwards. Smaller players are always accepted. It is a, a, a sign of health within a sector of economy, but they cannot support uh, their competitiveness through such a system on a European and of course on a grid level. The producing exporter of green electricity, this is a good vision for Greece to maintain, but also build within the EU auspices. Uh, the strong contributor to the Europe's energy independence, no need to, to mention that again, we can be the, uh, the active battery and the generator of electricity for Europe, at least through renewables, and the geopolitical reinforcement and sustainable economic growth, as I said before. We are in a region where we can utilize this wind and solar potential to provide us with also uh, more geostrategic importance. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be here. And to be Thank you for the I love, I love this field. It is my job. Let me just tell you that I actually am not an active lawyer because when I uh, got out of the law school 20 plus years ago, I had a decision to make. I loved the legal, uh, my legal studies, but I didn't actually love to become a lawyer. Okay, so I turned, uh, let's say, the vehicle towards the direction of energy law and policy, which is what I have done. And this is what I have been following through the whole of my life. And of course, uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I became an entrepreneur in the field of renewables, which I still follow. But I, what I will tell you by closing this is, yes, follow the pathway of energy law. It is a very important, a very useful, and also a very dynamic field of law. And it is something that will be needed uh, for all the visible time ahead. Thank you very much.